Welcome to Toffee TV. Today I am joined by Howard's Way director Rob Sloman. But we're gonna we will be speaking about the film because it's a massively important thing in my life and even more so in Rob's. But um but I want to talk to Rob about how he became an Evertonian and his kind of Everton story. So Rob, welcome. How are you? Yeah, I'm all right, Barry. I'm all right. It's not um, it's not too tricky yet. The boys, uh, I've got two boys, eight and six, and um, mm. uh, and they're quite enjoying running around the garden more often than they normally would. So it's it's not a big garden. It's not it's mm. not a big garden. I mm. was born and brought up on a farm, and and I, you know, what you, we could do if it was a lockdown when you're on a farm, it would be it would be a breeze. But um, but we're all right. It's not too bad. Homeschooling, great on you yet, or? <laughs> My my uh, wife has done a little bit more than me. I do the maths. I quite like. I I wasn't bad at maths at school, so I do the maths. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just a challenge to get them to focus because they're very aware that they're they're not at school. Yeah. Um, and our two our two would much rather be outside kicking a ball around. Actually, they'd just rather be not doing their schooling. And um, you yeah, know, that can be that's the problem. We haven't got two that would you know if if you give them ten minutes downtime, they don't go and read a book. Our two. That's no. not what they do. We would like them to, but that's you know that isn't their first choice. No, listen. I think you and millions of uh, other people around the country have all got renewed um, renewed admiration for teachers. I certainly yeah. have with Zach. God, Zach. The minute he's on a break, he's in the garden with the ball. And you're like, yeah, yeah, mate. You haven't finished your maths yet. He's, he's great at maths. It's the English getting them to write. Oh, he can do it, but getting them to write is a. Uh, is a bit of a pain, but anyway, well, you've just you've just mentioned there you were you were brought up on a farm. So how does how does a lad brought up on a farm become a huge Evertonian? Because the farm wasn't in Liverpool, was it? <laughs> no, no, it was in uh, in a place called Bewd in in uh, in Cornwall. Um, and I don't know is the answer. Not really. My dad um, my dad was a Man United fan, or he was a George Best fan. Uh, mm. George Best, Bobby Charlton. So. Um, I don't really. I don't think there was a, a moment, uh, particularly that that made me an Evertonian. I mean, the mid seventies, there weren't really many moments that would make you an Evertonian, were there? So, um, I think I like the colour blue. Um, so, by that theory, there's a bit in my head that sometimes I think could it have been Oldham or could it have been even mm -hmm. Chelsea? God forbid. And uh, but yeah, no, Everton. I think I liked maybe liked the look of the name. I don't know if that makes sense. It just looked nice. Um, <laughs> and then and and Latchford. Latchford was. Um, I think a, a lot of kids um, grew up looking at the number nine, the centre forward, when it was always a nine. Yeah. Um, and Latchford was six foot tall, good looking boy. Apart from the year when he had the perm. Um, but he uh, yeah. So Latchford and Everton somehow the colour Bob. Um, not sure, but. Got there in the mid 70s 75 6 um and um and you don't change do you no, my boys no. I, let me tell you my boys are, are, are everton and, and quite often they say would it be a problem if if i changed it and i'm like yeah it would be yeah it would be a problem <laughs> so we'd <laughs> so Get out the uh, family <laughs> yeah so you don't you don't change and i try and to tell them that you don't change it so even though you know other i go to football on on a saturday morning obviously not now but with the boy and with the boys and and you see a lot of kids running around in real madrid barcelona and that's what's happened with the champions league being much more visible than the european cup was for yeah. for us but you know i don't even know that i want my boys to have a second kit you know just in case you know so if they suddenly want the barcelona kit or the real madrid kit or the Ju juventus kit you know, I don't want them to then think, well, maybe I'll go that way. I mean, ugh. so uh, <laughs> so at the moment we're looking at, you know, Everton are reducing the prices and my wife's like, can we get them kits from two years ago? And I'm like, well, you could do. I mean, you know, because yeah. they're so cheap. They're like a fiver, a shirt or something like that. Yeah. But as long as it's not a shirt from, you know, somebody from a European giant uh, and certainly not a, uh, another shirt from... Um, from uh, England, then um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure whether I care what Everton shirt they wear as long as they're wearing an Everton shirt. You're a better man than me. I've got Zach's got all sorts, Homved kits yeah. and everything. He's got the he's got the lot, but uh, but he knows the score, mate. He's but not got an, he's not got another Premier League team. That is yeah, a no no. It's different for you. You're right in the heart. Yeah, of, yeah, yeah. Of Liverpool, you know, Everton is all around you. Although the yeah. last few times I've been up, I'm. Uh, I've got friends that say, you know, 20, 30 years ago, they would walk in the city and it did feel very 
blue, red, equally divided. And now when I go up there, and certainly they feel the same, that, you know, Everton does feel as if it's sort of doing that and Liverpool, you know, with the fact that they are so good at the moment and mm. and just the way that the, maybe the club has been marketed. But Liverpool seem to be sort of everywhere in the city. And then you're mm. like, oh, look, there's a blue scarf or there's a trader selling a bit of Everton. So, um so for for me, I'm worried that if they grab hold of something different now, they'll they'll never go back. Where at the moment, I'm I'm sort of the only thing that just keeps saying Everton, Everton. Don't worry, boys. It won't it won't be every week that we get beaten four 0 by Chelsea or, or or whatever. You know, they've had a lot of um, there's been a lot of weekends where they said, why do we support Everton again? And I'm like, just you know, don't worry about it. Stick with it. It'll it'll be fine. And and obviously doing the film actually was a big help because I've been sort of surrounded by Everton stuff for a couple of years now, and they're very young. So it, it's sort of all they know. And, uh, you know, I say well, I'm going on if I say I'm going on Toffee TV or, or whatever, they know a bit more about it and they understand it. And so I just try to make sure that they're surrounded by it so that it feels the norm and they get to an age where you just wouldn't change. <laughs> just keep it going until maybe we put, as you were saying last week, three or four games together where we don't get beaten, you know, and long for the 28 days. No, 28 games. 28 games, yeah. It, it is It's. A, it is a, such a difficult one. I know you understand what you're saying. You don't want them distracted by by other kits and, and what have you. But it, it is... The, it, the, the change... Interesting what you're saying about Liverpool because definitely there's that, there's that change um, with going... I, I take Zach to footy and, you know, certainly the change from when Liverpool won the European Cup, the Champions League, to the following year, with lad, with kids with Liverpool kits on the year before, there was like it was uh, there was still a few more red shirts. I have to say that just on this particular class, loads of blue. But then the next year there was one lad who had Barcelona kits and Juve kits and City kits, and all of a sudden had Liverpool kits on, and there was about eight Everton fans and about twenty reds from nowhere. So, but you got. You're yeah. gonna get that. You're absolutely right. Liverpool have been markets are better. They they be more successful. And if you're growing up as a kid, you mm. wanna you wanna follow the team that's winning, don't you? Really? And you sometimes, uh, as a parent, you look and go. I look at Zach and go, "Am I subjecting <laughs> you to?" Is it fair that I'm doing this to him? Yeah. I mean, uh, to be fair, Barry, our two will be living in the garage before they'll be wearing another Premier League shirt. That's fair enough, mate. That yeah. no issue with that. No issue at all. But uh, when I when I grew up, you know, there was uh, I was the only Evertonian. There was uh, Liverpool were successful even then. Um, Forest were were starting to become a force. I was talking. So I'm thinking sort of 76 through to to early 80s, and you know, Liverpool there was some Man United shirts um, or or fans. Uh, Forest, but no, I was the only Evertonian, and um, I don't think I even met another Everton fan until I moved away, and I certainly didn't meet one. Um, through school, so um, yeah, Corm- Cornwall's. I- I'm sure there is an Everton supporters club in in uh, in Cornwall, but I-, I never found I never found another blue. That's sad, isn't it? Yeah. It's sad, but then again, it makes your story. But, but what I did, but what I did notice was that as soon as we became successful, um, then you know people were very uh, accepting of me being um, an Everton fan and. And I told, I said to a few people that I remember, I used to wear, I used to have those sort of flat caps, you know, the, the, they were, there was lots of them around, around about the time of the Milk Cup final in 84, I remember. And I had one of those and obviously I had a scarf and I also got a, a really nice jacket with the, with the badge that you've got there behind the, the mid 80s badge. I had a, like a puffer a coat jacket and, uh, and I used to wear that all the time. And finally, people noticed me wearing it. Um, around about the time we were more successful and obviously we were on you know the telly a bit more uh, and you're winning things and people are talking about you the papers are full of you Um, and I remember walking getting on the so we lived in the middle of nowhere on this farm and school was like a 15 minute bus ride Um, and I remember getting on the bus in the morning and and walking down the coach and somebody just stuck their leg out to kick me sort of thing and when I looked at him he said you only wear all that because they win everything and uh, and I thought Wow, you know, I've waited a long time to hear that, you know, and and obviously it wasn't true, but I didn't care because that was that was really nice to hear that. What a, what a line that is! What a line yeah. you only wear that. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. I mean, how many times has that been said to an Evertonian? You know, probably never, Rob. Yeah. Probably absolutely never. But um, I know it, it, it. That turn, 
I mean, what what was that like training from from having a team, supporting a team that done nothing down there and being very much on your own and having to you know battle off? I suppose Liverpool would have been a team down there because Liverpool was the best side, you know, United and those kind of things. What was it like then being able to to puff your chest out and go, oh yeah, my team just won the, the FA Cup and my team just won the Charity Shield and, and things like that. Yeah, I remember uh, that that I used to so my the way that I would watch football in the in when I first started you know supporting Everton etc mid to mid to late seventies I used to have to go to bed early on a Saturday for a couple of hours say sort of five o'clock till seven or eight o'clock and then get up again to maybe catch the end of Starsky and Hutch and uh, and watch match of the day um, and my Everton was you know the seventy seven Cup semi final um, and then the eighty I think 80 was the one that really broke my heart when we played West Ham in the semi-final. I was listening to it on the radio, and obviously you're, you know, you're building up images of what's going on there. And I remember Latchford's goal, just the noise on the radio, and to get to an FA Cup final, all the way through the 80s. But at that time, obviously the whole day was dedicated to your team. It meant, it meant so much. And obviously the ones that were going to the game, it, it was, it was a very different experience because I was just relying on TV and radio for my Everton. And so I just got used to the disappointment. I remember crying my eyes out after that West Ham replay and the header that bounced at a you know, bonkers angle from Lampard's dad. And uh, that, was, that was really what I associated with Everton, was sort of disappointment. Um, and I think I was... Um, and I remember the following season, because the following season we got to the quarterfinal, didn't we? We beat Liverpool and we beat Arsenal and... Um, and I, uh, at school, I was always into sport and I put together a, a, like a magazine. Um, and, uh, and the only reason I put it, it was a sports magazine, just wrote out all this stuff and then typed it up um, and sold it at school. And I got into trouble for selling it because the teachers wanted to know what I was doing with the money. And I was just like, well, keeping it. And they were like, well, you know, no, I don't, maybe you could give it to one of the school charities or something. And I was like, really? But I remember, I remember doing that because I was fueled by Everton's cup run that it made me think, Oh, I'm going to write a magazine. And, uh, and, and in it was about three pages of other sports and then five pages on Everton's cup run. And then we got Man City. And, and I remember I did a quiz and it was all sort of questions of basically about Everton, I think. And I offered a, a packet of hubba bubba gum to the winner. Do you remember that stuff? And, uh, yeah. uh and then Everton lost the replay, and I, I, know, I never mentioned the magazine again. I, I just thought it just took it, every, took the wind completely out of the sails, um, and I, and that's that's really what I thought. I just thought, well, this is going to be how it is, and then it really was. When you talk about it, you know, eighty three disappointment, disappointment, disappointment in terms of league position, and you know, I'm not up there feeling it, but I saw the Coventry game on Match of the Day and the booze and everything else. And, and literally, I think the next time we were on match of the day, we're in uh, an FA Cup quarter final. We're in the, you know, the 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 final of the the Milk Cup, and 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 we're going on a run. You know, we we lost only three games, didn't we? After mm. or something like that, and you know, so it was because you know your club wasn't regularly on match of the day. In those, it's literally, it was about another seven or eight weeks, and boom, we'd gone from being booed off the the field to on our way to to Wembley in. In, in two cup competitions. So, you know, the happiest I think I've ever been was, um, and again, it's listening on the radio, so it's a very different experience from many of you, but but listening on the radio to Heath's goal in the semi-final. Um, because my my sister was, she had an interest in, in, in football and her team was sort of Southampton. She wasn't that bothered. But, mm -hmm. um, but I remember pacing around the room and... Uh, because obviously being down in Cornwall, Plymouth had lost. Plymouth were in the other semi-final playing Watford, and it was, it Watford, was a really yeah. big story. So the potential for Everton to play Plymouth, you know, in the FA Cup final, with that being my local team, it was it was crazy down there at the time, and um, and they'd lost in normal time, hadn't they? And ours had gone to to. Mm. So it was the, it was the game on the radio. George Riley, wasn't it? it yeah, that's right. Yeah, header. George right. Riley header. Yeah, and um, yeah, Plymouth in their green and black kit that day. At Villa Park. Yeah. Yeah, um, and um, so Everton's on the radio. Heath scores that goal, and then and again, it's when the radio distorts, you know, because the noise is too great, and uh, that's you know, it was you know, all I heard was the the cross go in, and then just a massive distortion, and you'd catch every other word or something. I thought. 
bloody hell, we, we've scored here. We scored. You know, and my first thought, I've got to be honest, my first thought was, we ain't going to lose now. We're not going to lose. We got mm. one, we're one nil up and we're two minutes away from, you know, full time of, of extra time. That, mm. that was it. I remember running around and my mum going, have you won? Have you won? And I go, well, we're not going to lose, you know, because the negativity that had sort of become being an Evertonian was right. And then the minute that you, you know, it's over, it's done. You've won a cup semi final. You're just thinking, hang on a minute. We're going to have that day where BBC and ITV in an era, I think there was still only three channels yeah. in 84, like channel when was Channel 4 coming? A bit, maybe maybe around then. And there was only three channels and two of them were going to be dedicated to your team for a whole day. All yeah. the various specials and, and and celebrities in the hotels as it was with Freddie Starr and Michael Barrymore being desperately unfunny in the in the Watford Hotel. I don't know if you've seen the clips. Yeah. But, you know, he wasn't very funny. Freddie was better. <laughs> um, yeah. and, uh, and But they were massive stars at that time and everything was focused on the FA Cup. It was it was a bigger deal as far as a fan was concerned, certainly as a TV viewer was concerned, much bigger yeah. deal to win the FA Cup than it was the league. Yeah, you know? definitely. And, and the European Cup was this sort of um, glamorous type thing that you saw at the end of May, usually featuring an English team that you, in those days, I, I didn't get the sort of hatred. So I used to actually want the English teams to... To, to win those things and, uh, and yeah, not know yeah. any better. I didn't know any better. And um, the FA Cup final was it. It was everything. It was absolutely mm. everything. And the excitement to that day and flicking the channels furiously. So I don't think we had a video recorder in those days. So it would have been going from one channel to the other so you didn't miss anything. It was just, you know, that that day, um, uh, the, the semi-final to that day, are prob- that's probably my happiest ever time being an Evertonian because I thought we'd win it. Because, you know, obviously with Liverpool were you know, by a distance, that we thought by a distance that the best team. But we weren't playing Liverpool in this final. We're playing Watford. And, and I honestly felt like anybody else but Liverpool and, and we'd probably win it by that time. And, you know, it was just the best time ever. That's so exciting. Going to school every day, you know, and, and just inwardly glowing. You remember those Ready Breck adverts where the kid yeah, yeah. was ready. Like he'd have that ring round him and he'd go there and, you know, he was... He, he was he was safe against the cold and everything else, and I, that's how I felt. I just literally I probably did my best schoolwork for that period of time. I was just really happy, you know, because mm. I knew what was coming, and it was, yeah. And then the day itself, if I wasn't already convinced that I'd be an Evertonian for life, that that was enough. Without the following season, that was enough. It was so glorious that whole yeah. day into. Then you watch. Then you wait all evening until match of the days on, and just you know go through an hour of it again. It was just, yeah, yeah the happiest, the happiest I I ever was. And my other, my other sporting sort of heroes and loves were right at their peak at that time. Seve mm. won the Open in '84. Viv Richards, who I absolutely loved, was you know bashing England all over the place in in '84. And mm. uh, yeah, '84, fantastic. And Everton sort of at the at the front of everything. You know, it was it was it was brilliant, brilliant time. Incredible, and then obviously we go on and win the league the following year, and you know we're in it, some incredible runs and incredible performances, and you know I, I'd said to you before the twenty eight game unbeaten run <laughs> from losing at home to Chelsea before Christmas to losing at Nottingham Forest in May, you know twenty eight games in all competitions, just unbelievable, and bouncing that, teams by fours and fives, it was just. Amazing. That, that was that was the thing about going to school thereafter. You know, once um, the I, I I don't know whether I thought we would challenge for the title. I think everyone just assumed Liverpool would win it in those days. But after mm. you know, I remember we were we were staying away somewhere when we beat uh, Liverpool one nil, and that getting home to watch match of the day that night. I think that was the moment that that I thought. Geez, you know, we've gone to their place. Not, it's not, you know, like, it's not like an Andy King, you know, moment that's. No, no. You know, it, it was. We've we've gone to their place. Watch the highlights. Reedy, Reedy should make it two 0 you, you know, he goes through and he pokes it wide with his right foot. Yeah, yeah. Um. So we we deserve to win that game. And after mm. that, you know, Man United off the back of it five nil. And then you, I literally was going to school. Um, I I, I would sit in assembly. And I, I didn't hear a word. You know, I just kept thinking in two days time we're playing again or, or whatever or tomorrow or Saturday. Mm. You know, it was just I cannot wait for the next game. And and, and I, again, I consumed it differently to, to everybody that was up there and, and probably, 
you know, most of you guys remember the radio. If you listen to the radio, that it was Radio Merseyside or Radio City. Well, no, mine was Radio 2, Five Live as it is now, but then it was Radio 2 mm. and Peter Jones and Brian Butler, and they used to come on air. I used a bit of it in the film, but the music was so iconic for me that it would come on, dun, 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 and it would come on the radio, and they would come on after the games had kicked off. And you had no means of knowing what the score was. We didn't have CFAX on our telly, so you had no idea what the yeah. score was. And I remember the Everton Tottenham, because that was rearranged, wasn't it? Because it was re yeah, yeah. owned. So they played it in early April, and they came on it. And obviously, that by that stage, that's the game. Because I think we were three clear with a game in hand. So if we yeah. win that, we go six clear, you know, and, and a game in hand. And you just think, well, we don't look like losing to anybody. So that game was no. massive. And I remember them coming on the radio. And as they always did, I think games kicked off at 7.30 in those days, but that, I might be wrong about that. But they said, this has already happened. You know, they would come on air, they'd do the build up, you know, and give it all that with the music. Mm. And then they'd say, and this has already happened. And you'd be like, oh my God, please be an Everton player that they say first, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and they did, you know, and um, I think it was a clearance, wasn't it? Um, by Neville. Did it start from Neville? And they, they said, Southall's kick. Or something like that, and then grey, and and you're like, oh my god! So you know, the radio was the way that I sort of got my um, uh, my football in the in those days, and it was it was amazing. And and literally, you went from Tuesday or Wednesday to Saturday, just knowing that they would win the Sunderland game where they concede after no time at all. And you know, again, now I am watching it. I think on CFAX or the telly printer that they used to have on grandstands. You know, the little. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, and they would go to these grounds at half time, and and I remember, I think um, John Watson, or I can't remember who did that. Was it John Watson did the Sunderland game? I think it was Watson. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, and he was purring about Everton in that game, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, Andy Gray had scored those two headers, and you were like, oh, I cannot wait to watch this on Match of the Day. I cannot wait to watch it. Um, so it was it was an incredible time to go to school like that. Um, I, I, you know, it's it's funny because you always I don't I can't believe I'm 50. Time just sort of shoots away from you, doesn't it? But you know, when I think mm. about it, I I still feel like a kid when I think about it. You know, and and it was 35 years ago, but I can remember being sat in assembly. I can remember it vividly. Just thinking, I don't I can hear that everybody's talking, and I hope nothing's directed to my class or me or anything. <laughs> Because I've got not a, not a Scooby what they're saying. I'm just so excited, and I've never. That's the only time in my life I've felt like that about Everton. I think because mm. you get older and and you start work, and then other things are more become important. I wouldn't say more important, but other things become you know important, important and, in your life. Yeah. You know, uh, and it just means that you can't focus all your time and energy. You know, I never thought about anything else other than sport and, and Everton. Mm. You know, I, d I didn't have to. I did my homework, but. I'd have done a lot better at school, I think, if if I didn't have maybe maybe if I didn't have Everton. Mind you, the period I was doing exams, Everton were sort of top of the league, so maybe that helped me. I don't know, but um, no, it was incredible. And and actually, the the following year, um, when we got to the to the cup final, having just lost the league, and and I think at times Everton were even better. That's it, at times. Um, they played, you know, with Lineker, etc. You, you know, you just couldn't see how that side. And I don't know how many times that midfield played together um, after, because Brace got injured in '86, and although he played a lot, you know, mm. I'm not sure how many times Sheedy, Stephen, Reed, and Bracewell played together. And I bet if you looked at it, how many times Everton put their first eleven, the team that they would say was their first eleven on the pitch, you know, mm. um, how many times they lost, and that. That cup final with an injured Bracewell is probably one of the few games where they had what they would class as their first eleven in the cup final of the previous year when they were knackered. <laughs> mm. But that cup, the... that cup, sorry mate, the, that cup final no in '86 is where I first felt something against them um, because uh, I remember I had one mate that I knew supported Liverpool um, and Everton. At halftime in that game, and you know we got used to it by that stage, having all the fuss about Everton, etc. Um, it felt like our day, Cup Final day. You know, it's like this is what we do on Cup Final day. We get to May, and then we have a, you know, a, a whole day's telly dedicated to Everton. But I remember I had one mate who was an Everton fan, uh, a Liverpool fan, and we bossed the game, hadn't we? We were one 0 up, and and you know, really there was Sheedy had a chance, and just generally the way that the game was going, it it, it looked, and an era where we didn't really concede very many goals, 
Mm. Um, it, it looked, you know, fairly good. And they scored from Gary's pass and they scored and my and our phone rang and my mum answered it and I could hear her saying he's busy at the moment. He's busy. And uh, and they and they, somebody convinced her that she should give me the phone. So I ran to the phone and said, yeah, what is it? And, and I just hear all these voices going, ah, like that. And I thought, hang on a minute, I only know one Liverpool fan. So I just put the phone down, went in and thought, please, God, don't lose. Please, God, don't yeah. lose. So they did. And then 10 minutes after the trophy's been lifted, we live on a farm in the middle of nowhere and a car pulls up and there's half a dozen of my friends, what the, the Liverpool fan, and all the others are crammed into this car um, and they, they've, they've got Liverpool scarves and everything to come to taunt me. And I thought, you know, it's not like I used to go around saying too much about Everton. You don't as an Everton because yeah. you always feel that tomorrow it will, it will end, you know. But I did mm. wear my stuff and I was proud of it. And, uh, yeah, from that day onwards, <laughs> I've really, you know, I've had no time for them. And I've always thought our day will come. It hasn't yet. <laughs> No, it's it only, will. It's only 34 years on. It hasn't come again yet, but you know, I'm sure mm. that uh, at some point that it, that it must do. I mean, the law of averages, you know. I would say surely, it. you know. Well, you're talking there about that midfield. That was the last time that midfield played together. That yeah. cup final. Brace was out for two and a half years. Yeah. By then, when he come back, the Stephen had gone. Yeah. Uh, Sheeds will have played. Sheeds played again with him, but yeah. Reed had gone. Or well, Reedy went. Yeah, so, Reedy went. Yeah. So yeah, no. Yeah, I mean, so that that would have been it. But I would. I mean, listen. There were lots of players who weren't fit and played. Reedy said in the interviews for this that he wasn't sure that he was ever a hundred percent fit. They just played. You know. I mean, look mm. at the kick he got against Bayern Munich. You know. I'm not. I, I think he played again the weekend, but he, he certainly. Mm. You know, they they certainly went through a lot to get themselves back on the field. You probably wouldn't be allowed to do it these days. Um, no, you know, no, players no. that even might want to play when they're injured wouldn't be allowed to with the injections and everything else they used to take. But, but um, yeah, I, I would love to see um, some stats of, of how many games when we put that 11 on the field, um, whether it be 84-5 with Heath or Gray, um, mm. how many times when they played together that they that they lost. I, I wouldn't think it would be too many. And I think, you know, now you, you, you'll have heard what Paul Bracewell said. He was never right. He was never right. And if you look at how good we were in at the end of 84 season and then Brace joins, right, he was. People don't realise how much of a difference he made. We were never the same when we didn't have those two on. We were decent. You know, we were decent mm. with Reed and whoever, you know, mm. but Reed and Bracewell, it was just the chemistry that was absolutely perfect because they just, you know, I'd love them to put those, uh, you put the monitors on them these days to see, you know, just how far they've run. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and the distance they've covered and the work, those, they were exceptional. They were, mm. and they just worked together beautifully. And, and you, you're lucky in your, or, that's why we talk about the Holy Trinity and then we talk about the 84 fighter because it's very rare that you just get that blend, whether it be, um, those two or, or those four with, with Trevor and, and Kev Sheedy. But, you know, mm. y there was obviously something magical about that, that, that four that enabled us to go from being good at the end of 83-4 and, and holding our own to being much better than anyone. We weren't a little bit better. We were miles better than anyone else yeah. in 84-5. And I think if Bracewell, you know, you've got two injuries there and you've got um, Brace and Neville the following season – Every team gets injuries, but I think that's how you realise how key he was to the team, that we were never quite as good. And I know he played a lot of games, but you heard him last week. He was never right. No. And, you know, it doesn't matter what you do. If you're not right, you can't do it to the best of your ability. And if those four plus Neville play, I think I think we canter to the league. No, well, we don't canter because they win 11 of their last 12 games, but we win the league. Mm. Reed didn't mm. play against Oxford. Reedy didn't play against Oxford. You know, no. and um, yeah, we we probably games etc. Caught up, but if they if they are fit, Neville, I know Bobby Mims did really well, and the stats suggest. But it's not just about the stats; it's about the person, isn't it? And what he means when you sit in a changing room and you look and you've got Neville Southall at his peak over there, mm. automatically the team just there's something different about it. You know, the confidence, brace is fit. You know, everyone towards the end of eighty four five, apart from the cup final game two days after coming back. You look at 84-5, they were on a different level, you know, mm -hmm. and 
I know the team. I, I think Andy would have stayed if if Heisel doesn't happen. You add that if you have that four to choose from in an era where they didn't really rotate that much. But Heath, Sharp, Gray, Lineker. Lineker. You've got a bit of everything there. You've got the team. That squad was brilliant. I've said it before that for me, eighty. We were better eighty six than we were eighty seven. That that to me is a fact. And one oh, yeah. year we didn't. One no, year no, we didn't no, win no. Eighty seven was a did. miracle that he won it. He did. That's yeah. a. Um, it's a great achievement. People have kept asking whether we're going to do an 86-7 film. And, you know, if if someone walked up and gave us half a million quid, you could do it. But um, but the the that team, to get that team, when you look at the players that played, no offence, but you look mm-hmm. at the, the patchwork midfield that he had to put out sometimes and, you know, left, uh, yeah, Van der Nye played centre half and all this sort of stuff. You know, it, it was it was ridiculous how we got across mm-hmm. the line that year. And we did comfortably again. Mm. No, I, I totally agree. And eight, you're right, 86, if you've got Southall and goal and rushes running through, it's a bit of a different proposition than I Bobby agree. Mims. I agree. Bobby Mims did well, like you said, but yeah. totally different. And especially Bracewell. Bracewell was incredible. But obviously we won the league and then the way we fell away, it all broke up and we fell away. And that was difficult to take, wasn't it? And it's it's been, yeah. it's been difficult being an Evertonian, having tasted those times to what we've had to... You know, one FA Cup since yeah, and a charity yeah. shield. You know, when it, you right. don't ever foresee that, do you? But at that times when everything's great, that it's all going to be taken away from us. And it was the, and it was not just that fact. But you know, I go, I went to college. I went to do my journalism. It was only a one-year course. And that year that I was there, <laughs> Liverpool, uh, Liverpool win. Was it they win uh, or they're unbeaten for their tw- first twenty-eight games? And 20, their twenty-ninth yeah, yeah. was against us, wasn't it? And we beat them, but. You know, they were so we I went to college and we were the league champions and uh <laughs> and I go there, you know, ready to sort of puff out the chest and, and, and all this sort of stuff. And Liverpool win the league by a mile with mm. Beardsley and Barnes and Houghton and Aldridge, I mean, thumping everybody. Um and so it, it you know, it, it felt you couldn't even brag you know, well, we won it last year, etc. because they'd gone miles ahead of everybody again and obviously Howard's left and players are starting to leave and you know, we didn't recruit that well. And, and suddenly those times, are they're not just gone. And we've left them behind at pace, you know. Mm, it, it, yeah, really, yeah. yeah, it was like a, a Ferrari and a Skoda, wasn't it? You know, they've just come past us and we haven't got anything. And, and that's the shame because if none of those, you know, you can't change anything, can you? But um, we were so close and without knowing it, we're so close to the Sky era where money comes pouring into the game that... You know, if Heisel doesn't happen or if Howard stays, you know, it's lots of ifs. I know that. But, yeah. you know, it's hard to see that a young team, such a young team, uh, 85, 6 even, still very young team. They're all 24, 23, 24, you know, isn't still around in 92 when suddenly, you know, all the money pours in. They would have been because, you know, they would have won a bit more and therefore they'd have attracted better players. The game was starting to open up. So you would have stayed as part of that big three, four. You just mm. would have done, you know, if, if the, yeah. and I know people always go, oh, you say it all went wrong for Everton at, at Heisel, but it was the catalyst for everything mm. that went afterwards because Liverpool, they, they had players there that they'd established themselves. They'd won what four European cups by then. Every mm. player in the world had heard of, of Liverpool. So when Barnes and Beardsley are coming up for sale, you know, there's, there's not a lot to choose between Liverpool and Everton you know, I can. You can see why they went to to Liverpool with no European football around. You can still see why they went there. Mm. You know, and mm. Everton possibly thought they could get a couple more years out of these players that had just won. The, but they were, you know, we were injury prone. Peter Reid. So this is what I'm saying about Reid and Bracewell. Reid was on the the end of his sort of uh, mm. legs by that stage, wasn't he? Brace wasn't fit. So, mm. you know, we tried to replace with, with uh, Stuart McCall and one or two, and it didn't really work, you know. And Liverpool got their recruitment very right when they replaced pretty much a whole team of, around about that point, didn't they? And, mm. you know, we got it wrong. But, you know, Howard had left, and he was he was the key. He understood maybe better than anybody how to get the best out of those guys, proved it in 87 with that team. And, you know, within five years of winning the title, Sky are on the scene and we're nowhere, you know. Yeah. Uh, and, and that, that was it, wasn't it? Another year later, a season after Sky come in, and we're hanging on. You know, it was the, it was the anniversary the other day, the Wimbledon game. Mm. You know, I mean, we dropped too far for me to ever accept that that um, we would have done the same thing 
had the events not happened as they did mm. you no know, because yeah. if if europe is still something we play in it we'd have been in it every year one competition mm. or another you know and uh thus the name would have been bigger the players uh, attractive would have been better you know we would have just have been a factor and by the time that um uh, the, the Premier League comes in. We're not, we're not a factor. And most of those teams that, that you know, United's timing was perfect, wasn't it? They had this crop of kids coming through. You know, it was a perfect storm for there. The manager had weathered. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, the the dodgy period. He'd established his players, his team. You know, brilliant manager, obviously. But then came this crop, um, and Sky mm-hmm. come in the money, and, and United, although they struggled the last few years, but they had twenty plus years uh, uh, of being one of the two best teams. Um, and, and I can't help thinking that we might might have had a you can't have a dynasty if you can't play in Europe. You know, so mm. if 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 what happened to if Heisel happens in 75, Liverpool don't win four European Cups. You know, I'm not saying that True, yeah. Liverpool would have caused the problems in 75. There were lots of mm. fans kicking off everywhere. And it wasn't just them at Heisel. It's, mm. You know, so it, it wasn't. But um, if it happens in 95, United can't go on to establish that dynasty because then the European players were coming into the game and they wouldn't have gone to United. What's the point? Mm-hmm. Can't play in the Champions League. It happened. So Heisel happened in '85 and it chopped our legs off. And yes, we could have done things differently. In hindsight, it's wonderful, isn't it? And we would have done things differently, but we were denied the opportunity to build what Liverpool had done and what you know United did. You know, the Liverpool team from '75 onwards was in a European final. For, for something like 10 of the next 11 or 12 years. I mean, you know, yeah, no wonder, scene. Like, yeah, it was incredible, you know. So I'm not saying Everton would have done that, but we would have done mm. a lot more than we did. I know, incredible. But obviously, like we say, yeah, we won an FA Cup in the Charity Shield. We had the Moyes era and we improved, but we've, we've still not had anything. And, and you know, we... We're still scratching around now, looking for looking for something, aren't we, to just break this cycle? It's the longest period in our history that we've yeah. not won a trophy in. Um, so, I mean, we've got Carlo Ancelotti now. Is that, as an Evertonian, does that fill you with a little bit more optimism than maybe you've had over the last 10 years, I'd say? Um, I used to, when, when we had Moyes, I kept thinking we were on the cusp. I kept thinking, you know, we'd end a season... I think we were in sixth or, or seventh. And I think, you know, you'd read the newspaper headlines and you were linked with this player, that player. You know, I, I'd have been interested to see what would have happened if, for instance, um, Fernandez comes when he's going to come and doesn't come. And a couple of others. I'm not, we wouldn't have won the league or anything, but but uh, I, I did keep thinking maybe, you know, and and, and we were close to goal scorer away in, in many of those years. But um, mm. probably, I mean, I was, I quite liked when Marco Silva was appointed, I was one of those thought, yeah, he might be, you know, everybody took, I remember reading some people that had done, Alan Myers, I think had done an interview with him and other guys had said, mm. there's something different about Marco Silva. You can sense it, you can feel it. And, and I thought, okay, all right, this, you know, uh, I like the, 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 the fact that he had a V in his name, Silva and Everton. I thought it was, you know, mm. I'll clutch it any straw you will. And, um, and it started well, didn't it? And he played. A, mm. uh, I remember going into the Liverpool game season before last. You know when we when we played there and we went there and Andre Gomez was fantastic and then Jordan had the the issue at the end of the game and we mm. under Moyes I always thought that we took a setback and we we got back on the bike very quickly and were really good. I remember us getting beaten three two by Villa in a in a live game and Ashley Young scored just after we'd equalised. And we bounced back after that, and we we went on a really good run after that. I used to think that told a lot about Moyes in the changing room. We we had that setback against Liverpool, and I don't think we were the same again until right at the end of the season. And that was wow. really disappointing. Um, so, again, does that say something about the manager or the changing room? I, I don't know. But the thing I would say about having Carlo Ancelotti is that none of those players will go back in and start looking at the manager, you know, saying, no. I'm not sure about the manager, you know. Because mm. it's amazing that he's here. Do you not think it's amazing that he's here? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, like I, you know, when at the time I was thinking, as he got the same fire, you know, he's been an unbelievable yeah, man. He's won everything. That, but in terms of the but, name, yeah. But but what the way he's been since he come in, incredible. People I speak to with the club are just like, he's unbelievable. He's 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 amazing. You know, and we're talking technical staff, and I'm talking people just around the place. So. It isn't. It, it is. It, 
But, I, you know, I spoke when I asked Kevin Ratcliffe last week. He was like, it's about time, isn't it? Isn't it about time this club yeah. went and got actually them. got a manager that has done something? Yeah. And when you look at it that way, and he was quite blunt about it, Kevin Ratcliffe, you kind of go, yeah, it is. And you're right, no one's going to go in and go to Ancelotti. Well, what have you ever done? <laughs> Not in our squad, anyway. Um, exactly, so... Yeah. I know, I listen, I, I mean, it, it's fantastic and you'd like to think that look, none of us know how this is going to play out now with the, the season as it is. And, you know, I, I, I spoke to a mate the other day and he says it's a win-win for a blue because there's always going to be an asterisk next to it. Whatever happens now, there's yeah. an asterisk next to their name. Yeah, and they, yeah, yeah. they deserve to win it. They're an unbelievable team, aren't they? You know, they, yeah. they are. But it'd be quite funny if they didn't. And, mm. um, you know, listen, w- whatever happens... And however we come out of this and with FFP and, and, and quite what the effect will be, whether we do finish the season, if we don't finish, I, I don't know how it'll, and nobody really knows. So all the stuff mm. that you're reading in the papers about who we might sign and the figures that are being, no one's got a clue, yeah. really, not really. Um, no. And even the people that should have a clue haven't got a clue because we don't, nobody knows. Um, and um, and I think we saw that last night, that nobody knows. Um, and uh, I don't, I don't know quite what'll happen but you'd like to think that him being there gives us uh, a boost that we haven't had in many moons and obviously we have got some dough I don't know whether we'll be able to spend it but you know at some point we will be and he's there and crikey there aren't many managers that you'd like to have instead of him you know wafting around a a big checkbook because you know people he's very classy fellow isn't he you know he looks the part he sounds the part you know, it just everything about him oozes class. And um, you'd like to think that, that, that people out there, the players that might be coming in, the agents that are dealing with him, you know, that they go up a notch in terms of who they're dealing with here. You know, and nothing yeah, yeah. Marco Silva, you know, potentially mm-hmm. that that sort of respect level from a from an agent. You know, And the agents are all powerful these days. I was just watching the Ronaldo film um, again and uh, in, you see how much power they, they wield. Well, mm-hmm. Ancelotti's you know, right up there, you know, from what he's achieved in the game, he demands respect. You walk in, talk to him, you know, and, and, uh, and I like the look of the people that we've got behind the scenes now, Marcel Brands. I mean, he's just, he's impressive looking guy, impressive sounding guy, you know, and, um, you know, and I love the fact that we keep Duncan on board, you know, because yeah, yeah. You saw, I was at the Chelsea game and that's immediately, regardless of whether I was at many games as a kid, it's immediately one of my top five Everton moments, that Chelsea game. The release when uh, Richarlison scored, you know, mm. after three minutes or whatever it was. And mm. Duncan didn't even see it at the time. Duncan going herring down the touchline. I'm there with with Dave Feely and Keith. And it was just, uh, yeah, it was it was a, a bonkers moment. And, and to have Duncan still there to remind people what it's all about. And, yeah. you know, he really he really gets it. He really gets yeah. it. And um, yeah. and it gives you um, uh, it sends shivers up my spine when I when I see the stuff that he does on uh on social media etc but the when you mix that with the passion that he brought to the whole thing and to have him there with carlo and marcel brands and uh i don't know i mean it's a it's a heady mixture that that you just hope i think we deserve something i know that everybody do say this you know but we deserve something i often think how many clubs can relate to what we've been through and then i think of somebody like leeds you know, who've really, mm. you know, who, who were almost right there touching it, reaching out for, you know, uh, the very top level. And they they bombed, you know, and mm. nearly went out of business and they're sort of fighting their way back. Um, but there aren't many clubs. I say this to other people. I've said it to a Wolves fan and he goes, you need to get some perspective. But, you know, Everton, it just feels like we're owed after after 80 we're owed after 77 we're owed there's so many things you know we're owed after alan robinson in the milk cup final there's got to be something somewhere along the line where we'd get this huge dollop of of fortune and um you know i've always hoped it would come in a major match against liverpool <laughs> you know a semi-final that one where Jelovic scored a few years ago and they were awful the worst liverpool side mm. i've ever seen and we're one nil up at half time and yep. now we lose that game you know so that, that nothing ever seems to happen to, to give us that that sort of moment that, that I think, God, I think we deserve it, you know, and, I, and I'm not even from Liverpool and I go in the Winslow after a game and these people deserve it. You know, the team is etched on their faces. These people have lived it, 
You know, this is their life to, you know, much more than than, than mine. I mean, it's the most important thing other than family, but I say that. But um, other than family, it's the most important thing in my life is Everton and has been all my life. And yet these guys are on another level. They literally live for it day in, day out. And, you know, they deserve something, you know. we oh, <laughs> you, you could talk about hard luck forever and a day, but I really feel that we deserve something. We have some money. Hopefully we can go out and get some good players. And I think that the team that we've got in and around the club now is, is probably as good as we've had since uh, Howard was in charge first time around. Well, that is the nice segue into it. Obviously, the film, mm. the director of the film, you put it together, you had this idea, you've harnessed it, brought it to fruition. Um, was it just a case of, you all, You look back to, obviously it took you back to your school days and, and everything else, but was it just this thing that that team had almost, you said it before, slipped through the cracks, was, was gone unnoticed, and did you want to put that team back in people's minds by making this film and really remind people of what what your your standards of Everton mm. are. It's very much a part of it. I just want, I wanted to make a film about Everton. I wanted okay. to make a film about Everton and I wanted to make it my my sort of time. And I could have made it from the 70s onwards. You know, if mm. Everton had won something in, you know, uh, when they nearly did in the, in the Gordon Lee in the 70s, you know, I, I could have done that as well because it felt that felt like my era. But this, I kept, I wrote a little book. I've got it here somewhere. Where is it? Right. So I kept a, uh, a book, a journal, a diary that went through the season. You know, says so, so in here somewhere is that every game that was played that whole season is in. Look, look, right, right. So that's every match that was played in the in the top flight division one there. And I loved it and lived it. And obviously it, it was in there. And I wanted to, I'd want to make a film for ages and ages and ages about Everton, you know, to, to remind people. Because in our heads, Everton's a huge club. And we all, we all recoil when people talk about the big six, don't they? And they don't include us, you know. And mm -hmm. um, because that was never in question. When they talked about the big clubs all the way through my life until Sky, you know, until the mm -hmm. latter part of Sky even, we were always part of that big six because yeah, yeah. we had we were one of the wealthiest at, at some point but because we always won trophies you know mm. 60s we won trophies the 80s we won trophies but before before the we won the league in the 70s well we did yeah 69 70 so yeah. so we, we always we were always there or thereabouts you know uh, mm. and um so it, it hurts me now that um people don't know how good we were you know mm. and how big we are, not were, we are. Mm -hmm. you know, the fan base yeah, is yeah. still there. They're just hiding behind their sofas a bit now because the lot across the road are good again, really good. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, but you know, you see what happens if we win something. You see where, you know, the kids that are running around at, uh, at my, you know, I'm down in Surrey and the kids that are running mm -hmm. around on Saturday morning wearing Man City or, or whatever, you know, shirts and Chelsea shirts. You know, obviously we're quite close to Chelsea here, but, you know, why would they be wearing Man City? Well, it's because they win stuff. They've been winning stuff now. You know, those will be Everton jerseys if there's a bit of success. They just will be. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, you know, I, I think that um, it, it, it really it really troubles me that that people don't see us as a big club. Um, but maybe maybe I'm wrong, you know. But I saw that lovely graph that they had on uh, on Twitter the other day that that showed the history of uh, of points, etc. In the league, yeah. and Everton were top, nearly well, top two the entire way, the entire mm -hmm. way, and top for most of it until we got yeah. almost to year 2000, and that's when Liverpool and uh, overtook us, and then right at the end, mm -hmm. I think Man United did or something like that. But still, after all that, you know, we are. You know, you can't doubt the size of the club in terms of success mm. and history. It's just that, mm. you know, recent history, we've not done anything. You know, no, so no. I, you can't blame a 25-year-old for not thinking that Everton are, are, are a big club because, you know, they get to a, a cup final every now and again, but not really. You know, they mm. sixth or, or seventh or, or fourth one year. But you cannot blame kids growing up nowadays not wanting an Everton shirt. The, the neutrals I'm no, talking no. about, not the, just the guys, because why would they? You know, I mean, I have to, I had to force my two, you know, you know, headlocks every day. You no, know, what did I, what did Daddy say this morning? You know, <laughs> you know. Um, so Tottenham, no chance. So you, you have to. I, I wanted to remind people definitely. Um, it was uh, a magical part of my life, and mm. I just, my question was, will anybody ever share that ambition to, to take it from inside here and and and, and make a big deal of it? Because 
Yeah. I could have probably got a, a mini version of it away somewhere, you know, and, and mm. a couple of interviews and a little bit of highlights and, and not really. Um, but to get the opportunity to, to do it properly. Um, yeah, it was, it was brilliant. And I, I, you know, I'm sat in here, I'm in the same place where I put most of it together. And, uh, I wish it was a year ago. I wish I was doing it again. I wouldn't make many changes, but I just wish I, I wish I could be doing it again. It was brilliant. Great fun. It's a, it's incredible the way it's put you you know i've said it to you before but it, it's fantastically put together it's knit it's just follows a lovely pace all the way through it the stories from the players is incredible that, um, well, that's what makes it barry i mean you yeah. know it, it elevates because of the the fact that most of them can tell a good story and do mm. tell a good story so you know, to have Kevin Ratcliffe and Peter Reed telling the story about the shorts equally well. You know, both of them told it and they were very funny in telling it. To be able to bang them together like that and then to have Derek sort of bookending it with holding up the shorts and, you know, in his loft. So that was a bit of luck, you know, to know, to find that Derek had that treasure trove in his loft. And when I went to see him yeah. the first time round, he told me he'd got a lot of stuff, but we he had that loft as well. And I just thought, oh, that's, that's fantastic. And, you know, so... So to be able to, as you go along to get little bits of luck, like finding that the the Everton collection was at, at the library, you know, I didn't know that. And to meet Jan, who was an Everton fan, Jan Grace, um, and, and to go down there. And I mean, I could I could have made a film down there with the stuff yeah. that they had. It's just yeah, yeah, yeah. brilliant. So those are the little bit of luck, the little bits of luck that, you, you know, that I didn't know I was going to get as we went along. Um, mm. So... Most of it, you could sort of plan how it would turn out. You knew roughly what people would say. Um, but those lovely little stories, Alan Harper and, and Neville, I mean, I didn't know I was going to get that. But once you've got once you've got the first person mentioning it, then, of course, you get the chance to go and say that to the other one. Um, and, and suddenly you've got the two of them talking about it. And it's, you know, it, it's, it's a lot better. So, um, yeah, the player stories, I, I think, are what, takes it to another the, the, the editorial of the film was there anyway but right. the laughter that we get in the film and i had a brilliant editor mike brook who who um popped up on on twitter last night because somebody put that lovely shot i think it's john bailey's girlfriend's mum drinking a pint of lager at uh, at one of the dudes oh. we're at. it's a lovely shot and um you know brookie well, he just knew what were good shots and how to make stuff funny and we had a lot of fun um making it but the you know, those, those players could tell a story and, and um, you know, it was it was once you got the, the thread of the story, it was about putting those in at the right place with the right pace to keep people laughing and, and to sit there, you know, the first night that we did it, when we showed it at, um, uh, where did we show it the first, at the Odeon um, for the yeah, yeah. first time, November 2nd, and to, for people to laugh when Neville's in the cab just saying, you know, oh, they've set the city on fire for me. Um you know, to know that they were laughing at that when we didn't think they would they would laugh until Graham Sharp maybe held up the tea towel. That was probably the first time we were expecting a laugh, I think. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, they made the story. They, they, they made the film with the funny stories. And then obviously the ending is the ending and it, and it had to, to follow that. Um, and it's a bit more emotional. There's no sort of comedy at the, at the end. But, no, no. But, um, yeah, no, the, the, you know when you go to somebody and they tell a story... And they tell it so well. And I think Graham actually, Graham Sharp was one of the earliest interviews that we did. But I'd already spoken to Andy. We'd done that shoot at Goodison Park with the drone and the guys. Yeah, and, yeah. But when I spoke to Graham Sharp and he gave us so much time and, and he told stories, I thought we've, we've definitely got a film here. We, I knew at that point, uh, and that was, that was that week, we did about seven or eight players that week, but he was the first one that week, I think, or the second one. And and I knew as soon as we filmed with Graham that we had a really good film because he told lots of funny little stories. He'd got into it where we were talking about the 84 Cup final. And, um, you know, you, you know, you're ticking boxes as you go along. Oh, I've got a good story there. You know, I knew I had the short story to come when I had Reedy and Ratcliffe. And, um, you know, Kevin, Kevin Sheedy getting to... I, I felt like when I finished Kevin's interview, Kevin Sheedy, I thought... I don't think we've done justice to the to the free kick. So I spoke to him again and said, I, I want to go, if we can get onto Goodison, will you come and um, and, and do that free kick one corner, the other corner? And, and he did. And you were there that day, weren't you? you know. Yeah, yeah. We were busy Brilliant. in crossbar in the crossbar challenge. We were having crossbar challenge, yeah. yeah. Superb. So uh, so Kevin did 
did that that day, damaged his groin before we even started filming um, uh, and still went through with it, which is why they didn't go into the net with, you know, the usual sort of sheet Big power. Up. But um, yeah, yeah. but bless him, he, he was still one take, top corner, bottom corner, whatever, you mm. know. So it's little things like that as you go along. You've got in your head what you want. Film mm. with Kevin thought I need a bit more. Um, obviously, filmed with Gary Stevens, and if I'd have thought we needed a bit more, it would have been a bit too late to suddenly go back to Australia. But, but yeah. you know, everybody was, you know, Trevor was. Uh, I love talking to Trevor because he's he's a thinker. So you know, all of his answers are, are sort of thoroughbred answers, you know. And um, but they were all they were all like that. So as you go along, you're just ticking it, going, brilliant, great, got that, and then you just can't wait. So I'm in a little edit suite here, um, and I literally couldn't wait. I've never had a job before where I just are desperate to get the stuff ingested into the into the computer so you could just look at it to confirm that you got what you thought you got, log it all, loved logging it. It's a, most people think it's boring. You're just sitting there for about four or five hours going through, you know, the interview and, and just putting stars by the things that you might use and then going back over it and highlighting it. And I loved yeah. doing all that. Really tedious stuff and I love it. And um and then when you've got all of them, when we did Inchi, the Inchi was the last one we did in June, I think, middle of June. Mm. Um, and and then it was like, right, I've got everything now. So if we if we balls this up, then it's all my fault. Uh, it was just, I'll never do anything like that. It was brilliant. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing. Uh, some big news come out in the last couple of weeks as well, obviously, with regards to the film and um, and Everton in the community. So. Do you want to just give us a refresh of what's happened? Yeah, in so the last couple there were two. Of weeks? So, the, so the, main, the the investor in the film, um, one half of the investor in the film, he's basically um, Phil Brown, and um, he is underwriting the production costs. So he is now able. We are now able to say that all of the money that's raised from the film from day one, so not just mm -hmm. from now onwards, but from now, first. Yeah, yeah the first person that put their hand in the pocket to buy the DVD or do the download, all of that money is going to go to the people's place and building the people's place, which is obviously the mental health project for Everton in the community. And mm. um, yeah, we're keen now to, to let people know that, that that's the case because it is yeah. incredible. It's an incredible gesture. And um, hopefully we can get that place because what we're going through right now, that place, the people's place, is going to be so important at the back end of this, you know. Yeah. Because you know, we're, we're, you're all right, I'm all right, but there'll be lots of people out there who are struggling, and this yeah. is going to be so invaluable. And uh, and and Phil knew that. That's that's why he's done it. You know, he mm. I think he heard a, uh, an interview on the radio with one of the guys at Everton in the community, heard about that project, and thought, I, I want to support this. I want to help this. And he's in a mm. position where he can do it. But still, it's one thing to be in a position. It's another thing to, to, to want to do it, and he does. Do it, yeah. um, so every penny um, that, that's been raised so far and ongoing will go towards that mental health project, the People's Place. Um, and it, I, you know, I, I would like to think that would be a li literally a lifesaver. So um, you know, it's a, it's a great message to be able to put forward. And we've had um, the, the club are, uh, are on board and, and supporting us that people uh, watching this will probably see that they're doing a lot of promotion for Howard's Way at the moment because we all want to, you know, it'd be brilliant if we can get that place built, wouldn't it, be by, by what we do with the film. Um, yeah. And, um, yeah, so it, what are we now? We're, um, we're early May, so we've got mm -hmm. anniversaries coming up, so we're going to be doing things around the film and Everton are going to be doing stuff. So, you know, yeah, it would be, it would be great to think that the film plays a part in, and Howard's, you know, so, so Howard's legacy, legacy, effectively, the team that he mm -hmm. built, now playing a part 30 odd years on um, to putting something else in place that's going to really benefit Everton and Everton in the community. I think that's rather nice, you know. Yeah, it's, listen, that's an incredible, incredible circle, really, isn't it? It starts yeah. starts with you as a boy, with these <laughs> memories. The, no, but it does, the, these, yeah. you know, you're at school and you're listening to the radio, you have this amazing time and then... You go off to uni and the things aren't as great, and and then you get these years later and think I want to do something to remember that team by, and it all fits into place. The thirty fifth year anniversary, which sounds terrifying when I say it out loud, yeah. Yeah. but with that comes all of this funding now going into the people's place to help people with mental health problems for Everton in the community in L four, particularly when Everton yeah. relocates to Bramley Moor, the legacy will still be there, but but 
all born out of Howard as well and, and the team that he put together and you're part of it and, and it, that's it's, part of it. It's crazy to think that I used to sit there in assembly not listening, you know, because the team were that good and meant that much that this mm. would be sort of the end result of it. It is a bit bonkers to think like that, you know, mm. because obviously at that point I didn't even know that I was going to go. I, I still thought I thought half a chance as a professional pool player. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, we all, I still do. Down, down in Cornwall, you know, we're, there's a lot of us that are quite good at the sort of pub games, the indoor little games like table tennis and darts and uh, yeah, yeah. pool. And, and uh, that was where I thought, oh, that's my chance. That's where I'll make my money. Um, and then the eyesight goes. And But, uh, you know, just, just to sit there and uh, to sit here now and uh, and think it, it might make a difference is, uh, is brilliant. And um, I, I don't know, sometimes you just think there's a greater power that's controlling all these things. You know, I got to spend and work... With, uh, spend a lot of time and work with Seve Ballesteros, who was a massive hero to me. I love my golf, or I used to when I played it before the two boys. Um, and uh, Seve was the only golfer that I've ever given a monkeys about. And uh, to get to work with him, to, to play golf with him, to get to work with him, to make you know films before he was poorly. I made some stuff afterwards, but but mm. before he was poorly, to have a you know Augusta and you know, St. Andrews and, and bonkers, things like that. You know, how's that happened? How did that yeah. work out for, for me? And then Everton as well. You know, it's mm. uh, it, it's crazy to, to think that, that I'd get the opportunity to do this. So, I'm, so yeah, I do consider myself, um, you know, there's a, there is some luck, you know, so I go on about not Everton not having any luck, but I've definitely had some. And, you know, I just need Viv Richards now, but Fire in Babylon, I don't know if you've seen that film, brilliant film about the West mm. Indies cricket team. So I probably can't, I can't do anything with Viv, but uh, you know I have to be satisfied with Everton. Absolutely outstanding, outstanding. Listen, Rob, thank you very much. Took lots of your time today. It's an incredible story, um, <clears throat> and that way to finish it with with what you've done, which will now contribute to building what is massively important. So, uh, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Thanks, Barry. Cheers, mate. See you soon. Hopefully, you will. Take care, mate. Bye.